Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a very great delight to see you here. It was a pleasure to have a meeting with uh, Mr. Defort at the Dhaka Foundation's office uh, some weeks ago, and I was cognizant of the correspondence and the long-term planning that went on, so it is very uh, pleasing indeed to see all that coming into fruition uh, today. And uh, principally, I should say that I greatly look forward to your uh, concerts uh, today and I believe tomorrow uh, also and needless to say we all feel profoundly grateful to the uh, Hlavka Foundation for their hospitality I think that it is something that is very palpable to us all that this place has a special genius loci um, it's one of very few places preserved with all the initial with, with all the original features in this way and the spirit of Hlavka and of the musicians, writers, artists that he supported in, in the sense of offering them advice and hospitality and uh, friendship is very much uh, evident here. And of course, the connection with Antonin Dvorak is particularly close. Um, and uh, I was asked, initially the plan was I would just talk about the Mass in D, but I should like to present the Mass in D by Dvorak, which in the uh, Czech lands has been known as the Luzhanska, the Luzhani Mass, rather than the Mass in D, because yeah. it is so intimately associated with this very place. Indeed, the very same chapel in which uh, you're going to perform a, a little later this afternoon. Um, that I should say that, in my opinion, the work that I'm going to talk about, this piece, this composition, uh, may be considered the finest flowering uh, of the friendship between Hlavka and Dvorak. And the necessary correction must be made as soon as I said the friendship between Hlavka and Dvorak. I ought to say, really, the friendship between the Hlavkas and the Dvorak's. Because it is the wives of uh, Hlavka, uh, his second wife, Zdenka, Zdena, no, Zdenka, Zdenka, uh, and uh, Dvorak's wife, Anna, who were friends. Both these ladies were, earlier in their life, because before they got married, professional singers, and they knew each other. Uh, Anna Frantishka was the first to marry. She married Dvorak, and so the three of them got to know each other. And then a year before the piece I'm going to talk about was composed, because of the friendship between the two ladies, Hlavka and Dvorak met. And Hlavka asked Dvorak to compose a mass that he could have performed during the consecration service at which the chapel would be dedicated, dedicated to the uh, Holy Virgin uh, Mary. So that is the background to this. Now, why were those two men such good friends? One interesting thing that we should point out is that although Hlavka was very wealthy indeed, he designed and uh, built as architect and as contractor a very large number of uh, buildings indeed in a short space of time. He was what we would call these days a workaholic. He started from modest beginnings and managed to rise to the top of his profession. The same thing can be said about Dvorak. Dvorak never became rich, and certainly not as wealthy as Slavka, but uh, he also reached the top of his uh, profession, and so there was a real warmth, a real feeling of sympathy between those two people, and Dvorak never accepted any money from Slavka. Indeed, even for the mass that he composed, which was a commission by Slavka, he did not receive any money. Uh, I'm sure that if Dvorak had been in financial difficulty, Slavka would have helped him. But let us remember that the time when they met, a year before the Mass was composed, Dvorak already was established, and though he was not rolling in money, he was comfortably well off. Uh, but the friendship was very important to him. Uh, Hlavka was a man of considerable intelligence and wisdom, and Hlavka was able to advise Dvorak on a number of occasions. 
uh, not least for Dvorak's negotiations with international publishers and that sort of thing. So there was a genuine and warm friendship between the two, and there was a certain difference in age, so we can imagine uh, that perhaps Lavka considered Dvorak to be a sort of younger brother, one might say. He wasn't young enough to have been his, his son. They also both had comparable family tragedies. Um, now, tragedies that perhaps are much more unusual these days than uh, at that time in the 19th century, but Hlavka uh, lost his beloved first wife, uh, Marie, and in fact he outlived his second wife, Zdenka, as well, so he was bereaved twice. And Dvorak, uh, his first three children, died at a young age. So both men were uh, bereaved, and so they had much more in common. More positively, they had more in common in the sense that they had both been recognized by the Austrian state. They both received decorations. I think it's the Order of the Iron Crown, third class, from the Austrian Empire. And they both received honorary doctorates from uh, universities at home in Prague and abroad. In the case of Lafka, it was, I think, the University of Krakow in Poland. In the case of Dvorak, it was Cambridge University, which awarded him an honorary uh, doctorate. How they met their wives? Well, uh, it is said, in fact, Suk, Dvorak's son-in-law, uh, you will probably be shown, or you may have been shown, the bedroom where Suk usually slept when he was a guest. Uh, so, Suk is believed to have said to an acquaintance of his, and that's the origin of this story, it may well be true, that Dvorak had initially fallen in love with uh, uh, Josefina Czermakova, the elder sister of the lady who became his wife. But even if that might be true, we cannot be sure, uh, judging from his correspondence with his wife, Anna Frantiska uh, Ne Czermakova, later Dvorakova, judging from the correspondence, he had a really warm and positive relationship with his wife. She was his piano pupil initially, so that is how they met. As for Zdenka Havelkova, later Hlavkova, uh, uh, um, her father was an important lawyer and member of parliament and a friend of Hlavka's. And so when her father once visited Lavka, he brought along his daughter with him, and that is when they met. And they married in 1886, a year before the mass was <coughs> composed and performed. So we can see the two pairs here next to each other. Of course, the photographs are not contemporary. I, I suspect that this is a much earlier uh, photograph. So... I mentioned that it was first performed in 1887. The premiere was in this beautiful chapel, where we shall go uh, in a little while, on the 11th of September, 1887. So I am able to share with you this with special pride. Through sheer coincidence, uh, I was invited by the foundation to give a lecture, rather like this one, exactly 130 years after the premiere, <coughs> on the 11th of September 2017. You can see I look two years younger, <laughs> more hair and, and so on. Uh, but none of us had noticed this fact. And I was in the middle of the lecture when I suddenly realized, wait a minute, what is today's date? So say it was around, around uh, uh, anniversary, so to speak. So I was rather pleased uh, uh, about that. Now, what do we know about the Mass? The Mass is of special interest to me because it's associated with this place. It was per per performed in this place, <coughs> composed for this place. Uh, but as it happens, I'm involved in producing a new edition for the publishing house of Berenreiter. Mm. So I've had occasion to delve quite deeply into the circumstances and particularly the manuscript sources. So what are the manuscript sources? Uh, <laughs> Um, yes. Any similarities with that person are purely coincidental. Uh, but before I mention the manuscripts, there's also something that I need to acknowledge. Indeed, it is a pleasure as well as a duty to do so. 
Uh, there's a musicologist called Dr. David Beveridge, who lives in the Czech Republic, and who uh, produced this wonderful monograph, which specifically documents having found correspondence that no one else had noticed and really left no stone unturned and gone to every nook and cranny. Uh, he has produced this volume full of documentary evidence and precise references about the friendship between the Borjaks and the Lavkars, and the circumstances behind the genesis of the mass, the circumstances of its early performances, its reception in the press, and the whole history of the work. So, particularly if you are fluent readers of the Czech language, <laughs> allow me very warmly to recommend this book. It has been extremely useful to me, and I've benefited enormously from it. I'm happy to say that the author, David Beveridge, is now working on a full uh, study of Dvorak and his oeuvre, which will be, I suspect, a massive volume and an extremely valuable volume, and that will be in English. So it's worth looking out for. But I'm happy to acknowledge that this monograph was commissioned and financed by the Klavka Foundation. It is one of numerous very good things that the Foundation uh, have been doing. So this is the volume that I should like to recommend. So the manuscripts that have reached us, some are in England, some are in the Czech Republic, are, first of all, a continuous sketch of the mass that Dvorak wrote roughly, but fairly precisely. There are gaps, but I would go so far as to say that with a bit of work, it should be possible to perform this sketch, more or less as it is. Of course, I'm not suggesting it ought to be performed instead of the mass. But as an interesting experiment to let us know what his most fresh initial thoughts were, it is very interesting because there are some things that are, on the one hand, surprisingly mature, and which you find with minimal changes in the final version, in the mature versions. There's more, more than one entry, as we shall see. But also there are some things that are starkly different, strikingly different. And so if we organize the performance of it, you would, if you know the mass, one of the standard versions, you'd immediately be very, very shocked and surprised that that bit goes very differently. He modulates completely differently. And why did he change it? You may even find that you prefer the older version. I don't know. <laughs> the very day when he completed this sketch, which is about 50 pages long, on the 26th of May, 1887, that same day, he started the autograph manuscript of the organ version, the initial intention was that the mass would be performed by voices and organ, no orchestra, as it were. And this version can be considered to be in its own way a definitive source, uh, although we shall see that there was a bit of development. Let us leave them until the end, if you could, if you could uh, uh, make a note so that you won't forget what it is that you wish to ask. I'd be very happy to take questions um, afterwards, if I may. So this is what the title page looks like. And uh, this is the very ending, as is usual with Dvorak, who was a pious man, a religious man, a believer. He gives thanks to God. And he writes where it is that he uh, finished it in Visoka on that date, the month, the date, and his signature. Now, as soon as he completed this autograph, which is not particularly easy to read because there are corrections and you have to do it rather fast, he must have sent it to a copyist. And the copyist was a gentleman called Jan Elsnitz, about whom we don't really know very much. But there's a postcard of which the contents more or less say, Mr. Elsnitz, I wrote to you about the mass, but I didn't get a reply. Are you done yet? Because Dvorak was under pressure to have copies available and the vocal parts available so that the singers would learn, the organist would learn, and so on. So he's a little bit nervous and he gives instructions saying, the, one of the alto parts, send it to me because my wife must learn it. Mrs. Dvorakova was one of the singers. Mrs. Slavkova was also one of the singers. There was a total of, we believe, 12 to 14 singers, including those two ladies, and they sang in the chapel. I haven't been able to work out where exactly they stood. Dvorak conducted.
uh, a very well-known organist called Klitschka had played the organ. And it's not very easy to imagine how all these people would have been <coughs> positioned so that they could see Dvorak. I've conducted in that chapel in different positions, and I can testify that it's not easy to keep things together if you've got half of your singers up there and the organist uh, uh, somewhere else and you're down below or up at the end of the gallery. But uh, this Elsnitz chap was under pressure to get on with it, as it were, and we shall see what happened. So, in Lujani, a set of vocal parts was discovered, which I was able to photograph some time ago. Um, I'm not sure, though, that this particular one was done by Elsnitz, because Elsnitz was a good copyist. And yet, if you look at the way Kiri has been spelled, with an I instead of a Y, it doesn't make a very good impression. Uh, most people should know that Kyrie Eleison, the K-Y, the second letter is a Y, not, not an I. Anyway, so this is just a specimen from this uh, source. Now, Elsnitz, uh, by the beginning of August, had completed one copy. We believe that it was done from the autograph, because there's no other source. It may have existed, but it didn't reach us. So, presumably from the autograph, and then shortly thereafter, this is the first page of it, he produced a second copy, of which this is the title page. And this second copy, this second Elsnitz copy, which I call B2, which is kept at the British Library at the moment, it belongs to the British publishers Novello, who've given it as a permanent loan item to the British Library. The crucial thing about this item is that long after the premiere in Lujani, and even after the early performances, one of which Dvorak himself conducted, and then other people were entrusted with the score and they conducted, Dvorak wanted to get the mass published. So he made the score available to the publishers Simrock. But Simrock, for some reason, didn't want to publish it. But he passed it on to Novellos in England. At that stage, Novellos didn't want it either. And although much of this correspondence has not reached us, uh, there is a letter from Simrock to Borjak saying, well, I'll send you the score back. So we may assume that Simrock managed to get the score back from Novello and return it to Borjak. But a year later, we see that Novello has accepted the score. Now, Borjak had gone to London in person. We didn't know what happened. Why is it that Novello didn't want it initially, but then they did accept it later? Did the score stay with them all along? Or did Simrock get it back to Dvorak? And did Dvorak send it again or bring it with him to London um, when he had his meetings with Littleton from Novello Firm? We don't know these things. But the crucial thing for us is that this second Elsie's copy is the manuscript that Dvorak submitted to be published. And he made various changes and corrections. You can see he's written here instructions saying that if the chorus is large, then the solo sections ought to be sung by a semi-chorus, by a smaller group of singers drawn from within the chorus, and not by soloists. So please do it that way. Prosim Rajteta Uchi, Dvorak. And one very fascinating thing, and which will be included in the forthcoming publication that I'm preparing, Dvorak added a part for cellos and double basses. So in a sense, this version, is something that goes, approaches to some extent, goes some way towards the later version, which Dvorak wrote for orchestra, chorus, and soloists, which is the version of the mass that is perhaps best known. And what happened is that Novellos accepted this score, and Dvorak was paid, I'm happy to say. But then they said, look, we have demand from choral societies in Britain who like to give concerts with smaller orchestras. Could you please provide us an orchestral version as well? We will pay you more. And Dvorak said, yes, OK, I'll do it. But he needed a score, because the autograph was with Lavka. Dvorak didn't have it anymore. We don't know where the first manuscript copy of Elsnitz was at that time. So Novello sent Dvorak the second Elsnitz copy back so that Dvorak would use it to prepare the orchestral version. That manuscript Dvorak then submitted to Novello, and it is in the British Library also. 
But it seems that Borjak remained attached to this version with organ and strings, because later, years later, he wrote to a friend saying, uh, although my mass has gained a lot from the orchestration, yet I still feel I'd rather like to have heard the organ version. And so he may have been reluctant to return the score. We know because novellos had to write to him repeatedly. And the last time they wrote to him, the letter, particularly given that novellos usually were extremely courteous and very respectful of Borjak, but this last time they wrote demanding, send it back to us at once. They needed it, of course, because they wanted to produce a vocal score with a piano reduction for choral singers. And they thought that having the organ version, the organ part may help them produce the piano accompaniment. Although, in fact, <coughs> if you look at the novello vocal score, you will find that the accompaniment is very, very pianistic. And so probably the organ version was not used, except that there are two movements where there is an organ solo, and that exists in the orchestral version also. Now, one interesting problem is, you will remember I said there were two manuscript copies produced by Elsnitz, and they have the same mise en page, they have the same disposition on the page, the bar lines are the same, the pagination is the same, and you saw how untidy the autograph manuscript was. So one would reasonably assume that when Elsnitz made the first copy, he made the second copy from the first copy, which was easier to read. But there is evidence to the contrary. Here, he went terribly wrong and he messed up the words of the Osana in Excelsis. And it just doesn't fit. He was careless. But the second copy is fine, which is proof that he could not have made the second copy from the first copy, at least not for this movement. So it's not quite as simple as it looks. And of course, the added part for cello and double bass is very interesting because it doesn't just follow the pedal part, it does interesting things. There are string effects, pizzicato there, uh, reiterated notes, here you've got alternating brrr, the meaning of the gloria. So it's quite exciting and gives a new dimension. And we might pose the question, why on earth did Dvorak decide to add a cello and double bass part? Well, there is an interesting reason how it happened. Initially, it was born out of necessity. After the private performance in the chapel, which is quite a small space, uh, as you know, uh, was over, Dvorak naturally wanted the Mass to be given a public premiere, and uh, it was decided that it would be in Pilsen. But the Church of St. Bartholomew's, where they wanted to perform it, which had a good organ, uh, was not available because the clergy, being a little conservative, decided that it was not appropriate to perform a mass in a concert situation. So that was vetoed. So eventually they had to put on the first public performance in the municipal theater. But that didn't have any organs. They brought two harmoniums for accompaniment. But harmoniums, I mean, they're lovely instruments. But A, they're not terribly loud. And B, they don't have pedals. So what Dvorak seems to have done, in order that the bass line be heard properly, he added this part primarily for double basses, but there was a cello as well in the first performance, as, as we know, out of necessity given that there was no proper organ with pedals. But then what we found is that when the Prague premiere happened, in the Rudolfinum, in the Dvorak Hall of the Rudolfinum, it was not yet called Dvorak Hall at that time, <laughs> but it's the same place. Uh, my colleagues and I are performing here, Dvorak as it happens, but it's the Tedem, not the Mass uh, in D. Now, this is not the original organ, but we've got descriptions of the organ at the time, and it was uh, considered to be a first-class instrument with, I believe, four 16-foot pedals. Yet, what seems to have happened is that the added part for cellos and double basses, uh, added out of necessity, seemed to work so well that Dvorak rather liked it. So that after that, even when he had a proper organ at his disposal, he decided that he wanted the cellos and the double basses to play as well. But that cello and double bass part was forgotten. The manuscript was left in the Novello's archives. Afterwards, it went to the British Library. And it was forgotten. 
because the uh, version was superseded by the orchestral version. And when in the 60s Czech musicologists produced a version for organ, they used the autograph, where there was no added cello part. And even relatively recently, when Michael Piltington produced an edition, he had access to the same score, but he assumed that the cello and bass part was not original. Oh, and the final source uh, is the orchestral version. And uh, you can see that's the strings, the vocal parts, and the wind added at the top. The one thing that was published in Borjak's lifetime of this work was the vocal score by Novellos, which Borjak dedicated to Mr. Josef Lavka, the president of the Czech Academy of the Emperor Franz Josef for Science, uh, Literature, and Art in Prague. And we have a letter by Dvorak informing Hlavka that this is being published, and he was able to approve this. But confusion arose because musicologists later on assumed that the later version of this published by Novello uh, was the one that Borjak approved. But by then, people had changed certain things in the score, as I shall mention in a moment. Anyway, to have a look at these sources, I made my way to London, to the British Library, where I have to say that the staff were exceedingly kindly and courteous, and with trembling hands, I held these things in my hands, and you can't, of course, take any pens in there, but with a pencil, I made about 30 pages of notes, because I was particularly interested that this is the score of the organ version with the added cello and bass part, mm -hmm. and this is the orchestral version. But you can see things that Borjak did. Borjak made a lot of changes, corrections, and I tried to make a complete inventory. Uh, one could write a little monograph about those things, and perhaps I may yet live long enough to do so one day. Uh, but the thing that is so exciting is that you get a real feel for the way the composer's mind is working when you look at the changes that were made, and when he used a blue pencil and wrote in huge letters with a lot of pressure on the paper. Remember, he conducted, so some things he wrote in, a, in big letters that he would see them very easily, changes in tempo and that sort of thing. Uh, and there are some interesting details that I will go into later. But uh, in a similar way, uh, looking at the <coughs> autograph manuscript by Borjak of the orchestral version is very exciting because you see such things like, like this. Look. Uh, the Mass did not have an introduction. It started with <laughs> the two introductory bars. <laughs> so the sopranos could have their note to start from. If it is just with organ, the organist can give a little A and they pick their note. So this was added later. How did he do it? He just stuck a piece of paper on the score, as, as you can see there. Or another little thing that you can see when you look at the manuscript, the Benedictus, which starts, even in the orchestral version as we know it, with a beautiful organ solo. Uh, it seems Borjak initially decided he will do away with the organ, and he rewrote it for strings. But for some reason he didn't like it, so he crossed it out. But we can see how his mind worked. That does mean that when, as I'm doing, uh, one is working on a new edition of the organ version, and it's not quite clear how the parts are moving together because there are some slurs and phrasing marks that are re really rather vaguely positioned, you can see, ah, it's like that because there's a viola part that goes up and down, and so that's probably the middle part, and so on and so forth, so it's very useful. Now, another interesting thing that you find when you look at the uh, uh, original manuscripts, indeed all the manuscripts are like that, you find that the words are different. Dvorak seems to have written this mass in a flurry of red-hot inspiration. He did not look at a missal to check that he was writing the text correctly. So there are some grammatical mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, I conducted the Mass in <coughs> Germany with the singers of Cologne University, and I thought, ah, yes, the Germans, they are classical scholars, they're going to 
rebel, uh, Dvořák wrote uh, in una baptisma instead of in unum baptisma. So I thought they're going to be very annoyed. In fact, no one said anything, but there are such errors. Uh, lumen de lumine has become lumen de lumini. Now, these are little errors, and it is perhaps desirable to correct them, so we have standard Latin. Uh, but there are other things that are not errors. There are words missing in the credo. Wherever Dvořák found some words that inspired him, he, re he repeated those words, and the music goes on, and it uses the same words. And then he forgot a sentence and went on. There have been people who have been saying, ah, maybe he had a theological difficulty with uh, the resurrection or this and that. I don't think that is the case. I think that he was not particularly careful. But also, let us remember that we live in post-Second Vatican Council times, and every word that is sung is significant. But in Borja's time, no matter whatever bits and pieces the chorus would have sung, the celebrant, having turned his back to the congregation, would recite the whole of the text of the credo. So it was less important whether the chorus will sing it all. So I think we should not make a, a big theological issue uh, out of that. But the words are different in some instances. Now, I found that the printed editions had dynamics that were contaminated by the orchestral version. And I say contaminated uh, because the dynamics of the orchestral version are often very different. In some instances, they are exactly the contrary. Where you've got a crescendo in one version, you have a decrescendo in the other. I'd say, broadly speaking, if you tried to pin me down and made me, uh, you know, squash me into a corner and made me summarize, I'd say that maybe we could say that the dynamics of the orchestral version are more Wagnerian, they're more longer term. After all, the sound is thicker and fuller. Uh, the tempi may have been slower. The metronome markings are only in the orchestral version, not in the organ version, and they're quite slow. They are gloriously, splendidly slow. They're not easy to bring off, but instead of as a da da di da 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 di da di it's it almost becomes slightly impressionist music. Uh, there are various signs uh, of modernity in Borjak's score. So it is not a good idea to combine the dynamics from the orchestral version and put them in the organ version as other people had done. And generally speaking, the organ version has fewer dynamics, which need not at all, in my opinion, mean that uh, he just didn't bother to write them, but they should be done. I am convinced that there are times when he didn't mean any dynamics to be done. It's an effect that Borjak uses in other works as well, as we shall see. So, noticed here, notice here, there's a crescendo there from the A to the A to the D, the soprano part. And yet, in the autograph manuscript of the organ version, there's a diminuendo, not a crescendo. In Elsnitz's copy, that diminuendo has moved further to the left. Instead of there, it's there. <laughs> now, was Elsnitz careless? But then Borjak looked at this and he approved it. He didn't change it. I like to think that Borjak, who loved Legato, as I do, uh, would have liked the sopranos not to get any louder when they move from the A to the D. One should not sing the D louder just because it happens to be higher. So it's trying to compensate for that effect. Um, this is a summary I've made. There is a crescendo in the orchestral version, but there's a diminuendo in the Elsnitz copy, and in the autograph, it's there. The orchestral version has a crescendo, the crescendo there, but Borjak doesn't have it. And here, you can see as we go on, one version has that, the other one has that. The two things are not compatible with each other, and so should not be combined. And this is what the final version looks if you base it on the second as its copy that Borjak corrected and approved. All you have is that. And this, which appears in the organ version, is a published edition, is incorrect. You don't have that in the manuscript. You see, it's not there. 
I said that, in other works, also Dvorak enjoys not using crescendos and decrescendos as a positive thing to do. This is a, a well-known choral a cappella piece uh, from his choral cycle in Nature's uh, in Nature, I think, the Prelogue. Uh, and look. <laughs> separate pianismo, no dynamic changes. So, I'm not convinced that it was a special decision on his part. If he done, just did another crescendo, the crescendo, this effect would not have been so well uh, prepared. So, it's already different from what we heard. Nothing. <coughs> and then when here it goes, it's much more affected and passionate. So we must not assume that when Borjak doesn't write dynamics, that the poor chap was too lazy to put them in, that we ought to add them ourselves. I think not. But there are other sorts of uh, incompatibilities as well. One version has a sforzando there that has to do with et incarnatus. It goes with the verbal stresses of the Latin text. And that's the peak, and then there's the diminuendo. But the other version, the organ version, if I remember rightly, et incarnatus, because there's a dissonant harmony there. And so, in one version, Borjak is giving precedence to the verbal stress, and in the other version, he is giving precedence to the uh, maximum tension that arises out of the harmony. It's a slightly different aesthetic. We should confuse the two, because we spoil them. They both need to have their existence in the right context. There should be a separate edition for the orchestral version, and a separate one for the organ version. Now, the second Elsnitz copy that I, I'm particularly interested in also allows us to see things that Borjak changed, not necessarily because Elsnitz made a mistake, but because Borjak thought better of something. So in the autograph, he has got these things which Elsnitz copied. The crucifixus, well, the bass sings an F, tenor a D, very nice. But Borjak decided that if he swapped the tenor with the bass, then the bass, instead of singing an F, would sing a high D. Much more dynamic, because basses singing a D makes much more noise than if they're singing an F. And the tenor's an F instead of a D. Now, what happened is that Borjak adopted the changes he made on this manuscript for his orchestral version as well. So they were carried over to that version. And the final thing I briefly mentioned to you already, which is that Borjak had second thoughts about what should be sung by solo, uh, soloists and what should be sung by a smaller group from within the chorus, particularly if the chorus is large. And uh, when I did this in Vienna and also in Cologne, I did it like that. And the uh, paradox is that you get a much more wonderful chamber music-like feel. If instead of having four fat opera singers standing in front of the orchestra and singing solos, you get those passages sung by a smaller group from within the choir. It's a magical effect, and Borjak wanted it. But he changed his mind a number of times, and so if you try to reach conclusions just by looking at the scores, uh, it's rather chaotic, I'm afraid. And one other little detail is that uh, Borjak does not usually put slurs or phrase marks when the vocal part is sung with a lot of notes to a single syllable. But we have instances, this is the orchestral autograph, where he has and it's going to be a lady song. Uh, but 
that slur there and that slur there, they must have a musical expressive purpose of some sort. Um, yet, you find many instances where there are the most fascinating slurs and phrase marks, such as there, for example, I thought, oh, wow, he must have really wanted to stress that despite the change of text, they need to sing all this legato. In fact, that is not the case. There are much more banal reasons why that thing arose. And to understand that, we have to look at the first continuous sketch that I mentioned, which has not been studied uh, so far. I wrote a little article about it uh, a few months ago. So you see here, uh, on one syllable, there's all this. But in his autograph, when he moved from his sketch to his autograph, Initially, he copied it as it is in the sketch, just one syllable. But then he changed his mind and he added those words. But he, that thing stayed. He didn't bother to remove it. And then when poor old Esnitz was copying in a terrible hurry, he mechanically copied that as well. The reason is not that Dvorak wanted this to be sung legato. I mean, he probably did want it to be sung legato. But that's not the reason why that uh, slur is there, or rather that phrase mark is there. The reason is that initially in the sketch, Dvorak did indeed have one syllable to all those notes. But he changed it, but Elsnitz didn't quite pick that up, and so he just copied this onto this. So we ought not to pay too much attention to these things. They do not really have much meaning. Now, my final example of a very, very interesting progression as we move from the sketch to the autograph version of the organ version to the Elsnitz copies and then to the autograph of the orchestral version is this far in the Benedictus. Benedictus qui venit, if we sing the A Appoggiatura. Now, should we or should we not? And where did that arise and what does the organ part look like? Well, the key is to look at the sketch. And you will see we've got this E flat major chord. No vocal part. The altos aren't singing. No one is singing. It's just the organ on its own. And the A is in the organ part, a dissonant note. And it moves uh, upwards, it's prepared. But the dissonance, the element of dissonance, is built into the organ part. Now, what happens next is in this autograph manuscript, the organ part stays more or less the same. The E flat major chord and the A is there. But the vocal part has G, G. Benedictus qui venit. Against the G, G, the organ moves G, A, B, R, G. So the dissonance is there, but it's still in the organ part. Now, in the first Elsnitz copy, for some reason we didn't know, was Dvorak giving some sort of instructions to Elsnitz? There may be letters that he wrote. We haven't seen them. Uh, he may have told them something. Or just Elsnitz was careless. But here we find that the A has gone. It's G, G, and there's no dissonance. Nor is there here any dissonance. It's G and G. That's, that is something that someone else added later. But in the second copy, which Dvorak was able to have a look at and check, well, he found that it's E flat major. He left the organ part alone, but he decided he wanted to restore the A, and he added it in the vocal part by changing the G to an A. <laughs> so somewhere deep in his mind, he must have been aware that the sketch had a dissonance. And he wanted to return the dissonance. But the dissonance migrated, as it were, from the organ part to the vocal part. And this is what we can see if we put these sources together. 
And of course, he adopted it and he carried it over into the orchestral version. You see, there it is. Now, this is one example in the credo where Elsnitz interpreted something that was not terribly clear in Dvorak's autograph in a different way when he produced his first copy than when he produced his second copy. Here, this little note, I don't know how clear you can see it. It looks more like a G than an A, but it's uh, placed rather high. This ought to be a G, in fact. And when Elsnitz prepared his first copy, he got it right, and he wrote an A. So it goes E flat, A, G, an F is being held below. The alto part has F in natural, which is the leading note because we're modulating to F. But, as I said, he seems not to have copied his second copy from his first copy, but from the autograph. And the autograph, you remember, is not very clear here. This, it's not absolutely clear that it's an A. It may look more as a G. So he looked at it, and he thought that this is a G. And then he saw this with an accidental in front of it. So he assumed it's an E, an E natural. So what he wrote is actually bad grammar. He wrote this, E flat G, E natural, and E natural there. But you cannot double a leading note, it's bad harmony. So Dvorak, when he saw this before sending it to the publishers, he couldn't allow the double leading note. But the fascinating thing, is that Borjak did not correct this by putting the G back to an A and that E into a G, as his original version was. He did not revert to his original version. He created a new solution. So he moved that F down. He kept that so that the E does not cross with the F. And he moved that part up to a G. So we've got a new solution that Borjak created as a way of making good the error perpetrated by Elsnitz. So these are the three versions. This is what Borjak initially meant, but he wrote that a, a little bit too low. And in his first copy, Elsnitz correctly interpreted this and copied it like this. But in his second copy, he did this, which is wrong. But Borjak, when he made this correction, he did not go back to that, but he created this. He kept that erroneous e natural and got rid of his own original e natural. There are other instances of this, and they just show that Dvorak had such a great flexibility of mind that he was always willing to devise some sort of new solution. Uh, and of course, both this and this are worth preserving. So in my edition, I put this in the main text since I'm based on this <coughs> manuscript. But I've got this as an ossia passage, so the performer, the organist, can decide which of the two he wishes to use. Now, I am grateful to the Nafka Foundation, amongst other, many other things, for the fact that I actually started looking at the Luzhanska Mass in the first place. I was very resistant about uh, performing this Mass. I felt that I did not have the maturity, and probably I was right. Uh, but they wanted the Charles University Orchestra and Chorus, of which I'm the musical director, to perform it under their auspices. So I learned it, but I noticed the changes in the text. So we performed the orchestral version with the corrected text, <coughs> initially in uh, Tetin, and then in the Bethlehem Chapel in Prague, then for the University at the Carolinum, and then in Vienna at the uh, Stefan's Dome in freezing weather <laughs> in <laughs> December 2012. At least that is my excuse for the fact that our brass were a little bit out of tune. <laughs> uh, but they did very well, I have to say. But then my dear friend Michael Ostriga, who is the general music director of Cologne University, he invited me to go and perform one concert with their orchestra and one with their chorus. And for the choral concert, he said, why don't you do the Dvorak Stabat Mater? And I said, well, if you want to keep the orchestra and the, and the chorus separate, let's rather do the mass in D. That works better with no orchestra. 
And then, due to the kindness of David Beveridge, who came to our concert for the Narka Foundation, said, hi, do you know that there's a manuscript where Dvorak added a cello and double bass part? Wouldn't you like to do that? So I told my friend Michael Ostriga, can you let me have a few players, a couple of cellists and double bass players from the orchestra for the choral concert? He said, yes, why not? So we were able to perform with the Cologne University forces and the excellent organist Laura Kalnina um, in the Trinitatis Kirche in Cologne, the first modern, modern revival of this version of the Dvorak Mass, which, as far as we know, had never been performed in the 20th century, indeed, never been performed after Dvorak died, because that version, the only manuscript witness for it, was kept in the Novello archive. And I should like now, in our final couple of minutes, to play you the very last bit, the Agnus Dei, the Agnus Dei, in this version, where I particularly asked the cellos and the double basses really to play out, so that you can really enjoy hearing them. Several things happen. One is that what seems to be the root of every chord in the texture acquires a new life as a sort of horizontal melody. And it is a beautiful melody, because it was Dvorak after all wrote it. And for Dvorak, melody and legato are paramount. The other thing is that Dvorak used all sorts of effects, pizzicato, read re notes, and so on and so forth. So it is, it is very, very uh, fascinating. And finally, it rather does remind me, this sort of texture, an organ sustaining the chords and a cello singing all along of early recordings of uh, Monteverdi and that kind of repertoire in the 40s and 50s, where instead of just playing a chord that evaporates into the air on a theorbo or something, and then really scratching the bass vial for a moment and then letting it fade and leaving the singer unsupported, you have this glorious, vibrant lower strings sustaining it and the organ sustaining it and proceeding in a legato way. So it does a little bit recreate that kind of texture that, you, that was already known to me. So if I may, I should like to play you uh, the Agnus Dei from the first modern revival of this version which took place in Köln uh, five years ago. 
As you see, top of the list is uh, the uh, uh, Lavka uh, Foundation, particularly mm -hmm. Professor Pavlicek, Dr. Ridlova, and Mrs. Kaufnerova, who has organized uh, our visit here, and Mr. Fons de Court, <laughs> who reacted, <laughs> reacted very, very uh, positively and in a way that displayed great uh, openness and receptivity when the foundation suggested that they might like to include a little informal lecture on the menu as part of the day's entertainment. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Jury, for the birds for singing. Yeah. 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 It was a little like Dvorak with a bit of mess. Yeah. 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 Thank you very My much. My pleasure. If anyone wants to read a little bit about this, uh, I've got a uh, uh, it was a tetralogy, but it's now a pentalogy of articles. Uh, and the new edition, God willing, should appear, published by Berenata Praha, uh, probably in uh, November this year, if we all sweat sufficiently in the summer months. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. And I believe tomorrow you will be visiting that very beautiful place in Praha, yeah, the Andre Dvořák Museum. So have a very great concert this evening as well as tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, it would be a great pleasure. Now, I have a suggestion. I know there may be questions, but I don't want to steal some of your rehearsal time. So I propose that anyone who has a question can approach me individually and I'll answer, but the, the musicians may wish to proceed to the chapel for their rehearsals. And we greatly look forward to enjoying the fruits of your labors. Thank <laughs> you.